Do do. Frig, I'm just trying to see if this thing works. One, two. I'm not a narcissist. Just trying this mirror effect, testing the camera, seeing how well it works. If you're new here, welcome to Doc U. If you know this channel, you know the study of fame and pop culture is my main inspiration for my documentaries. Fame is not just an experience, but an institution, a projected microcosm of a very real society. The wants and desires of people are the same inside or outside the velvet rope. Psychologically speaking, what attracts people to fame? I'm curious as ever, and I approach the concept of stardom from several different angles, viewpoints, and through several different people who fit the analysis. So subscribe to join the U universe. You won't want to miss what I discover, document, create, and share. We have reached over 4,000 watch hours and are not too far off from 1,000 subscribers. It's finally happening. Now, let's explore together. I've been doing research on the psychology of fame and, from my understanding, the psychoanalysis of a person who is not submitting to being psychoanalyzed is hard, but not impossible. There have been few people who have actually been spoken to by psychologists and they are kept, of course, anonymous. Additionally, the long-standing culture of the recyclable nature of celebrity and how delusional it would be to think you could be in that position tomorrow is not the only common thread that links those who want to be famous. It's how the ease of access to fame has made more people believe that it is absolutely attainable and a completely normal and realistic goal to have in life. The author of Fame Junkies, Jake Halpern, conducted a study in 2007 with Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Public Communications, where 653 New York kids from 5th through 8th grade were asked to choose between intelligence, strength, more beauty, or fame. Girls chose fame more often, and boys chose fame almost as often as intelligence. So, not only is the allure of fame more widespread than ever, the psychological aspects can actually be likened to the state of being an addict, according to psychiatrist Reef Kareem. He has treated several people that don't realize they are not famous anymore and are simply addicted to the void that fame fills in their lives. Kareem implies the names are big names of has-beens and my pop culture savvy mind can't help but fantasize about just who's been crying on his couch about their stale act not selling anymore. Paris Hilton was the first, the original celebutant, practically the inventor of that thoroughly modern phenomenon being famous for being famous. Now, though, this particular marketplace has become rather crowded with people like Hilton's former protege and sometimes frenemy, Kim Kardashian, eating up a lot of the oxygen. Try bringing any of this up with Hilton, however, and things get a little tense. Do you ever worry about your moment having passed? <laughs> you want to wrap up? But Karim's treatment of his famous patients makes sense. Imagine being a one-hit wonder and the royalties on a song you wrote were enough to give you a continuous six or seven figure payout each year. The challenge of keeping your name on the charts and the social impact of being in such a rare position is something too big to give up. Even actors on small budget TV shows are making about $100,000 an episode to start. They may last for one or two seasons of a production that might be canceled and are still becoming millionaires from it. A smart person would grab the cash and go. Live frugally and enjoy life. No, not a person who wants fame. They need to fill that void with anything else but an easy life. They bathe in the spotlight, yet their souls never truly come clean in the process. At the end of the day, it's not money most people want. It's the thunderous roar of applause, prestigious awards, and worldwide recognition people desire. A business-minded person like myself would gladly settle for being a rich, financially free has-been. We see how tragic and embarrassing it is when people don't want to give up fame and, by extension, youth. A name came to mind, didn't it? That void is endless. Although the sources listed from Psychology Today medical blog site are plentiful, the empirical data on fame addiction is not because it is such a unique experience that only calls for introspection when it's time to show the person behind the art, which in and of itself is its own art form. Fame, however, is not a postmodern invention as it pertains to this channel's interest in pop culture. There have always been Alexander the Greats, Julius Caesars, and Napoleons, grand personalities that wanted to be known around the world for their dominance and rule the world with such influence to go down in history forever. And here we are, centuries later, speaking breath into their legacies. But we count that as history, don't we? Pop culture can certainly make history, but 
history doesn't need pop culture to exist to document its accounts. If paparazzi could stalk ancient historical figures with the barrage of flashes and record their every move, would they have relinquished any semblance of doubt in their standing as celebrities? This is a timeless issue just extended by our access to the famous, but that relationship with their narcissistic lusts is as archaic as history itself. Stars don't want to come clean about their respective relevance to modern day pop culture. They come with an expiration date. Have you ever sought out spoiled milk? The glass bottles of the 50s when doorstep milk deliveries were more prominent are nostalgic, but no one would ever want the contents of the glasses because of age. That is the truth about celebrities. They are pretty pictures from the past who all peak at one point or another. They think they are a timeless fermented delicacy when really they are pasteurized on a farm only to be replaced by someone else. They're not always the fine wine they think they are. Speaking of historical foresight, I hope to have a lengthy career as a filmmaker on YouTube. Before we continue, be sure to check out my first uploads on my other channels, Style You and Travel You. They're trailers for the U universe and my plans to create the Runway Retrospect series and short films of my travels when I get all my channels off the ground. Thank you, U Universers. I appreciate your support. Now, let's continue. Other studies depict that the acceptance of fame comes in stages. The 2009 paper, Being a Celebrity, the Phenomenology of Fame, for the Journal of Phenomenological Psychology studied 15 adults ranging from ages 35 to 86. The study conducted by Donna Rockwell of the Michigan School of Professional Psychology and David C. Giles of the University of Winchester interviewed relatively well-known celebrities anonymously. The professions of these celebrities ranged from a television star, a TV news personality, a state governor, a Hollywood actor, a TV sportscaster, NHL hockey and NBA athletes, a celebrity lawyer, a former R&B star, and a former child star. Based on the interviews, Rockwell and Giles identified four phases the newly famous pass through as they come to grips with their celebrity status. The first being love, hate. Quote, at first the experience of becoming famous provides much ego stroking. Newly famous people find themselves warmly embraced. There's a guilty pleasure associated with the thrill of being admired and that participants both love the attention and adoration while they question the gratification they experience from fame. I enjoy parts of it, but I hate parts of it too, was a generally reported theme. Donna Rockwell and David C. Giles. The second stage is addiction. The lure of adoration is attractive and it becomes difficult for the person to imagine living without fame. One participant said, it is somewhat of a high and another, I kind of get off on it. One said, I've been addicted to almost every substance known to man at one point or another and the most addicting of all of them is fame. Rockwell and Giles. The third stage is acceptance. As the attention becomes overwhelming and expectations, temptations, mistrust, and familial concerns come to the fore, the celebrity resolves to accept fame, including its threatening phenomenal aspects. You learn to accept it, one celebrity said. After a while, celebrities report that they come to see that fame is just so much of the will of the wisp, and you just can't build a house on that kind of stuff, Rockwell and Giles. The fourth stage is adaptation. Only after accepting that, it comes with the territory, can the celebrity adaptively navigate fame's choppy waters? Once you're famous, a participant said, you don't make eye contact or you keep walking and you just don't hear people calling your name. Adaptive patterns can include reclusiveness, which gives rise in turn to mistrust and isolation. Rockwell and Giles. Musical talent, your ability to dance, your ability to sing spectacularly. Um, and yet, you often seem very lonely, even though you're so talented. Is that, is that true? Um, it's better than it used to be. I, I used to um, sit in my hotel room and just cry just by myself. Because you can't get out, there's fans everywhere and helicopters and press following. And now that I've had my children, um, it's helped a lot. Then after that, several new stages arise once a person has accepted fame into their lives. First, they experience a loss of self. From an initial desire to become successful, the celebrity experiences personal confusion and a loss of ownership of life in a depersonalizing entitization process in which participants reported feeling like a thing rather than a person of unique character. All the while hearing one's name screamed out, the famous person feels as if he or she is not even there. 
the celebrity suffers a loss of personal freedom in relation to the world and develops a heightened capacity to scan his or her environment in a state of alerted attention in order to assess the possibilities of advance or the need to retreat. Rockwell and Giles. The next phase is mistrust. Eventually, the very others who adore the celebrity evoke mistrust. There is always a part of you that wonders why they are becoming friendly with you. In an everyday environment, the celebrity wonders, do people like me because of who I am or because of what I do? You find out there are millions of people who like you for what you do. They couldn't care less about who you are. Rockwell and Giles. Finally comes the arrogance we see that is so prevalent among Hollywood A-listers. A celebrity copes with intense public scrutiny through character splitting. He or she divides into two identities by contriving a celebrity entity, a new self-presentation in the public sphere. The only way I think you can really handle it is to say, that's not really me. It's this working part of me, or the celebrity part of me. Living up to others' expectations becomes a vicious cycle in which the celebrity, like a hamster on a wheel, works to satisfy a hungry and demanding public. The famous person feels the need to always be on. There is an obligation to be nice to everyone and that becomes exhausting. Rockwell and Giles Now, what about us? How are we affected by the construct of fame besides thinking we can have it? What are the psychological effects of being the fuel to the fire of addiction of fame by showing up to engage in celebrity culture in the form of our own addiction? The will to be famous is something definitely worth psychoanalyzing further, but celebrity worship syndrome is a classified mental illness all its own. See you in my next documentary. Let's see which one of us needs a shrink and how deep and dire our own obsession with pop culture really is. Doc you. Subscribe to join the U Universe. Uh, yeah!